this is going to be the section on cosmological simulations and, and specifically n-body simulations. And very loosely speaking, when people in the community talk about n-body simulations, they mean simulations where the only uh, force of nature that we really care about is gravity. Um, there's a whole other world of something called cosmological hydrodynamical simulations where you try to model all of the other complex things that make up the complex universe that we live in. Uh, because that re really requires a very dedicated set of uh, lectures in their own right, we will not really focus on hydrodynamical simulations all that much, except for a little bit that I'll tell you about um, towards the end of the week. Um, so, uh, how this will progress uh, is as follows. So, firstly, I will point you out to these two links here. All the lecture notes that I will be showing you over the course of the next few days are available online at this link. Um, so it's github.com slash my name slash precise underscore summer underscore school underscore sins. And uh, perhaps more immediately, um, there is a second link, which is github.com slash sean hyphen t hyphen brown slash summer underscore school. That is the link uh, from which you can download the GitHub repository that contains the data as well as some of the Jupyter notebooks that will be used for the hands-on sessions that we will start working on from the second half of the day. Um, what I would recommend you to do, because our original plan was that, as you will have noticed, you all have been given accounts on the cluster. Uh, because of various uh, logistical challenges, us all simultaneously using that for the purpose of what we want to try and achieve over the next few days is going to be it's going to be difficult. So Sean has very uh, thoughtfully thought of a workaround by which you can actually do all of this work on your own laptops. Hopefully. Um, <laughs> um, and so what I would recommend you to do, because uh, the second link contains a few pre-run cosmological simulations, it might take a little bit of time to download. Um, especially if there's 16 or 18 of us trying to do it simultaneously, I would recommend that you navigate to this website and start loading the repository now. Um, and then hopefully by the time we get to that session in the latter half of today, so maybe an hour and a half or so from now, you'll have the large majority of what you will need uh, with you by that time. Towards the end of the week, um, we will actually be considering a much larger set of simulations. Um, that will require of the order of 30 or 50 gigabytes worth of data if you want to do the full thing. Um, and again, because the cluster access is going to be challenging, we are coming up with a solution by which you can download this simulation or parts of the simulation in a way from a common link that we will share with all of you later on. So, Ideally, if you had 50 gigabytes of data going spare, that would be great on your computer. If not, you can work with small portions of the data, which would just be of the order of 10 gigabytes. And we'll, we'll talk about the specifics of that on Thursday. Sean, I don't know if you want to say anything. Sorry, so the bad minimum, I think, uh, the minimum we can get away with is like 5 gigabytes, which I think is a reasonable amount. Uh, 50 gigs, I guess, is a bit of a big ass, just to show up to your laptop. So that's optional, but bad minimum, you can use And, and, and really, worst case scenario, just find someone you like and then work on it together. <laughs> That's perfectly fine as well. And we can even do that in track as well. Uh, okay, good. So, uh, you know, cosmological simulations are, are really um, the, at the frontier of big data uh, and astronomy and cosmology. So, it, you know, 50 gigabytes is what, what I would consider like you know, a small simulation. Right? Um, and as I'll hopefully demonstrate to you over the course of the uh, the next uh, few minutes or so, um, this is a subject that has actually rapidly become quite a lot bigger in its scope and its ambition. Uh, I should say, if at any point you have any questions about what I'm saying, if you need any clarification about something, or you just want me to repeat something, then please just let me know. Uh, I have no problems at all with that. All good? Okay. Excellent. So, let me first lay out to you what uh, we hope will be the objectives of this course. Uh, so I want to give you, uh, I think, a good historical context of cosmological simulations and how they help us understand the universe better. And when I mean historical context, I really mean I will talk to you a little bit about the history of simulations. And I think that is a useful exercise because 
you know, nowadays we take for granted the calculations that we're able to do, but this was not obviously the case even four decades ago, um, cosmological simulations, although it has a rich history, is a subject that is relatively young in the context of astronomical research. The oldest science probably that we have been doing as humans. So giving you that historical context, I think, will hopefully be helpful. I'll then give you a brief introduction to some of the numerical techniques that we use in modern-day cosmological codes and body codes. Then we'll talk about, at some point, uh, how to create initial conditions, which is one of the key aspects of the problem that we're going to study, and how cosmology is introduced into an embodied simulation through the guise of these initial conditions. Um, we'll then talk about how once you have run a simulation, you have a distribution of matter in your fake artificial universe, how do we then identify things that we would call a galaxy um, or a dark matter halo in a way that we might then compare against observations, so identifying structures, we'll talk about that later on. And then over the course of all of these days, we will learn how you can design and run your own simulation, so we'll use a specific code called SWIFT, which is a modern uh, um, cosmological hydrodynamics uh, code that has been released uh, only uh, a month or so ago now, but it probably is the state of the art, or has, at least has algorithms that are state of the art. We'll then learn about how we can use various techniques to analyze the outputs of simulations, um, and hopefully if everything compiles okay, which is, you know, it's probably the hardest part of doing simulations, making sure things compile, um, you'll be able to run some of these yourselves as well. Um, and then I want to also give you a bit of a disclaimer that simulations, uh, it's very easy to say that you know, this is a good representation of the real universe, this is what we think is actually happening, but simulations are full of assumptions, they have limitations in their own right, so, so I think it would be good for you to come to an appreciation of where simulations are helpful, where perhaps they're limited, and where things should be taken with a pinch of salt. So the first couple of things that we'll try and do today, um, talk about initial conditions and the introduction of cosmology in day two, so I think that will be Wednesday, and then finally day three will be uh, talk about how we identify structures and so on and so forth. Okay? Good. So, why do we need numerical simulations? I think that that's kind of fairly obvious, probably, to most of you. And I think the key aspect of this is that cosmology, or the study of galaxy formation and so on, is a very, very high dimensional problem. Okay? in that the stuff that we are observing, the stuff that we call as the entire remit of the universe under which cosmology lies, is spread over extremely large distances, so several light years is what we call this large scale structure of the cosmic web. Within this cosmic web, we then have things called dark matter halos that basically populate these. These are you know, maybe a factor of a thousand smaller in size, but still quite big. These dark matter halos are the sites where we get the formation of galaxies, which are, again, another factor of 10 to the 3 smaller in size. And then finally, we know the galaxies are forming as a result of individual sites of star formation, which are you know, several factors smaller as well. So you span a very large range of orders of magnitude um, in wanting to study all of that, which you don't always see because it's the dark matter, but by using all of this, which is the stuff that you do see, which are the galaxies. So cosmological simulations are an effective way to try and study all of this together, or at least as best as we can. So how do we get to this idea of simulating the universe? Well, all we're trying to do is model a physical system. Okay, We're just trying to learn the system starts at some point A, we want to get it to some point B, how do we get from A to B? So you have to kind of know what the starting point is. You kind of have to know how this system evolves over time, and then see if it looks like B. Okay? And actually, for us, it's kind of easy, well, not easy, but it's, it's a well-defined problem, because we know what B is, because we can observe the universe around us, so we know what it should look like at the end. It turns out the initial conditions are actually super well-known. So what are the starting points from which this system of evolution should begin, that is known perfectly precisely, or as precisely as we can in any case. And we'll talk about that a little bit on, on Wednesday. 
And so the question is, how do we actually make this connection from the start point to the end point? And that's where you need to come up with a physical theory. Okay? So there's a physical theory that uh, is most popularly studied. It's something called the Lambda CDM model. Okay, it's a model of structure formation where the primary source of gravity is something called CDM or cold dark matter. And what causes the universe to grow in size and accelerate in size is this component of the lambda or the dark energy field of cosmos. It's important to bear in mind that lambda CDM, hopefully you've come across this idea before, is not a model of galaxy formation. Okay? What lambda CDM is, is just a model that predicts how gravity causes the initial conditions to turn into some non-linear set of structures. You have to then do something that connects the predictions of structure formation to observational data that we can study. Okay? And so this development of the connection between galaxies and halos is, is, is one of the most complex and outstanding problems uh, that we study. So n-body simulations are what helps us make this connection between initial conditions, physical theory, and predicting structure formation. Models of galaxy formation then help us go from predictions of structure formation to actual observables that we can compare with the real universe. Good. So as I said, I think it's useful to look a little bit about how cosmopod simulations generally have been used in this subject, and historically where they come from. So let's take a little bit of a digression and, and, and look at the history of the subject. Um, and I think the best place to start, really, is to start with a uh, Swedish gentleman by the name of Eric Holmberg. Uh, has anyone come across this name before? Holmberg? No. So, he is uh, unfortunately slightly pixelated. This is no reflection of my perspective on him, but this is a pixelated picture. So what Holmberg was interested in doing was to understand what happens when two galaxies collide. Okay? Seems like a fairly well-defined. Um, so, what you would do is you start off with galaxy 1, shown with uh, uh, you know, these open circles up there. You look at galaxy 2 with the, co uh, with the closed circles over there. Right? And then, you know, what you would do is you know the equations of gravity from Newton's laws, Einstein's theory of gravity, and so on. And you would then take this system of two uh, objects colliding, which is actually a problem we will do later on in the session, collisions of two objects. And then you see how that system evolves over time, and what you get is, you know, you predicted these kind of tails or tidal arms that are created as these two spiral galaxies interact with one another, the gravity of one tugs the gravity of the other, and creates these spiral, spiral arms that exactly mimic images that you can see of real galaxies in the universe. So you would think that to do this, you use computers, okay, to solve these equations. Of course, we have to look is, this was done in 1941. This is well before the advent of computing as we know it today. Certainly computing that would have been easily available. So Holmberg, uh, undeterred by this uh, you know, fundamental limitation, came to a very uh, neat solution, which is where he realized that actually these things that I've drawn here as particles are not really points as you would draw in a scatter diagram on a plot lake or something. But actually, these are light bulbs. Okay? So Holmberg realized that the law of gravity is a 1 over a distance squared force. Okay? And light decays as a function of distance as 1 over distance squared as well. The luminosity of something twice as far away is four times lower than something that is, is closer by. So what he did was he took 37 odd light bulbs there, 37 odd light bulbs there, connected them with photosensors, and he worked out the gravitational influence of one circle on another circle by just looking at the amount of light received on it due to the other, other light bulbs. He then integrated this system, not using a computer, but by getting graduate students to lift these light bulbs and move them around over a series of time steps, and he predicted this during this exercise which was then repeated sometime later on at the end of the millennium, and you can exactly reproduce Humber's calculations on a computer, which he did on the light bulb, or such light bulbs. This is really cool, I think, right? This is human ingenuity solving problems for you. 
as time went by, it was actually possible to do computer simulations with a little more fidelity. Um, and now you can extend the answers using 70 light bulbs, and you can actually have 700 particles in the simulation, which is not large by our standards today. But this was a rather, um, you know, a seminal work by Simon White in 1977. So what this shows is on the top left is a distribution of particles in some kind of spherical uh, region. So it's just slightly inhomogeneous. Okay, so it's not quite uniform. You then basically let the system expand because we knew by that point that the universe expands. And we notice is that these clumps tend to get separated out, and all of a sudden. Gravity will start making these little lumps of these inhomogeneities start clustering together until all these systems coalesce into bigger objects, collapse, and form one big cluster of galaxies like this. Okay. So this was the first simulation of a cluster of galaxies, uh, and in fact, this picture could be verified with X-ray telescopes that then space-based X-ray telescopes that came on two years two years following this work. Um, which kind of showed the, the power of simply having gravity as a force allowing things to collapse and counteract the expansion of the universe. Okay. One other historical, uh, you, know, uh, you know, interesting aspect to this is that if you peer closely, it might be a bit challenging from, from further away, but you notice that these, these points look kind of odd, okay? So they're not really dots uh, in the same sense that, uh, again, the, in fact, if you sort of zoom into one of these and look at it closely, you'll notice all they are are just characters, H, O, X, so on and so forth. So because there were no plotting programs at this time, no matplotlib, no IDL, or anything like that, you would actually have to know where the points have to go, and then move the sheet of line paper, use your typewriter to set the point, and make a point that way. So it was a really arduous exercise. So you should be very glad that we don't have to do this uh, anymore. Okay. So what about dark matter? So I think the idea of dark matter, hopefully you've all come across this idea of dark matter in some form previously, this idea that the universe is dominated by some mysterious particle that uh, has a gravitational influence over everything. But where did this idea that dark matter has to be a particle really come from? Um, it actually came about as a historical accident. Uh, as a result of a uh, false experimental result, uh, which can be traced back to the 1980s by this group uh, from, from the USSR, who claimed to have uh, measured the mass of the electron antineutrino from the endpoint decay of tritium. And so they said, we've done this exercise, and we measure that the mass of the neutrino, or the antineutrino, is somewhere between 14 and 46 electron volts. So this, as particle physicists, they were like, oh yeah, fine, that's great. But this caught the attention of astronomers because this is about the mass range that a neutrino would need to have in order to explain the amount of dark matter that people were then predicting must exist in the universe in order for you to get flat rotation curves and explain other anomalies uh, and so on. Now this result turned out to be wrong by a factor of several. Um, but it gave rise to this idea that perhaps dark matter could be neutrinos. Okay, and that's kind of a nice, helpful idea because neutrinos. Well, we firstly know they are dark in the sense that they are not visible. Uh, we knew neutrinos exist, which is always kind of helpful. So they're a real thing, and we know that they have very weak interactions. So perhaps the reason why we don't really observe them is because their interactions are just weak. Okay, neutrinos, however at the mass scale that they were proposing, just a few electron volts, would mean that they would act essentially as massless particles, meaning that they would be able to zip around the universe at nearly the speed of light. And so people term this hot dark matter. Okay? Hot because just the thermal velocities are high. So, in the 1980s, taken uh, by this particular result, people did the first cosmological n-body simulations of structure formation for a universe made up of neutrinos as dark matter, and that's uh, shown here in this work by Clippin and Shandarin. You'll notice that the date is 1983. This work was actually done in 1980, 
but these were published in Soviet physics journals. It took about three years for it to actually appear in the English speaking journals. Um, so this actually predates it somewhat. So these top two panels are results of their computer simulations for what the distribution of galaxies <coughs> looks like in a neutrino or hot dark matter universe, compared with the then known distribution of galaxies that were measured with actual three-dimensional positions, so position on the sky and redshift, which gives you the third axis, and something called the CFA galaxy redshift. Okay, so it didn't have all that many, but it had some. Um, even if you didn't know anything about dark matter or galaxies, you can immediately say that those two things at the top don't really look anything like this one over here. Okay. In particular, you see these very, very you know, big, lumpy over densities of particles that are connected by these very long extended bridges that stretch for 200 million light years or so, that in no way resemble the kinds of structures that are observed in the data. So immediately, this ruled out hot dark matter <coughs> or neutrino dark matter, because the then known observational results for the clustering of galaxies was not reproduced by this model. And this is exactly what we do in cosmology, which is you take an idea, you simulate it, you see what it predicts, you compare it against observations, and then you see whether it's viable or not. So clearly this hot dark matter idea doesn't work. What happens if you go to the opposite end of the scale, where you say, okay, let's not say that dark matter moves around at the speed of light, zipping around the universe. Let's assume something called cold dark matter, so people went to the opposite end of that spectrum. They did this set of simulations, this is now in 1985, but they've now been able to move to 32 cubed simulation particles. In fact, later today, we will be, this was the state of the art at the time using, you know, like federal supercomputing machines that you had to get special privileges to actually use back in the day. You will be running simulations that are eight times bigger um, in just a few minutes on your laptop later this afternoon. And you could probably do the simulation on your phone very easily these days. So they did this calculation of something called cold dark matter, predicted these kinds of structures, these are slightly different choices of how much dark matter there is, compared with the observed galaxy distribution, and lo and behold, it actually doesn't look too bad. Okay. Visually speaking, but you can actually quantify this using something called a correlation function, which is something we will talk about on Wednesday. And you see a great degree of match between the observed data and the prediction of the model. And this is what basically led to cold dark matter being this prominent idea for structure formation in these kind of structures. If you fast forward a few decades, I don't want to bore you through what happened in the 90s and so on, but in the 2000s, by that point, you were able to make a pretty big step change in what was actually possible to do in terms of computing. Uh, the most famous example being uh, this work from 2005 by the Virgo Consortium called the Millennium Simulation Project. Um, this is probably the most famous cosmological simulation that has ever been run. It has about 512 times the computational volume of uh, what we were seeing in the previous slides, with more than 300,000 times as many dark matter particles. And what you can then do is create, well, not like nothing else, you can make nicer images of your simulation. And what you see now is a much more detailed level of structure, okay, in this distribution that's called the cosmic web, where you see these points at which filaments exist over very large distances, they connect together at these points of over there to that part, which you call dark matter halos. This is where we think galaxies would form. And the universe is then separated by these emptier regions called, called four waves. Okay. And what's always interesting is that if you compare this with, you know, famously with pictures of like neurons and in the brain, they actually kind of look very similar. And I don't know what that tells us about anything, but it's kind of fine. What's nice is that you can now not only make predictions of the large scale structure, but you can actually then try and predict how something like the Milky Way, which is you know where we live actually might have formed over the course of billions of years if one assumes cold dark matter as this model of, of structure formation. So this is a calculation that was done a few years uh, after the Millennium Simulation, something called the Aquarius Project. And what you notice is that there's time ticking away in, in redshift on the upper left, or in billions of years on the upper right. 
you notice that in the beginning there was basically nothing. It was a smooth, homogeneous universe, which is one of the assumptions of the cosmological principle that we go through. And as time progresses, this initially almost perfectly smooth universe starts forming nonlinear structures as a result of gravitational collapse. So the only force of nature that is being employed here is the force of gravity. And you can see that in less than half a billion years or so after the Big Bang, you already have something that looks quite a lot more complicated than the universe or the initial conditions that it started from. But the only physical theory here being the number C level. So right in the middle, you will notice that you have this big yellow over density of um, this lump of dark matter. This is going to be the dark matter halo of our Milky Way by the present day. So our own galaxy is much, much smaller than the extent of this dark matter. It would probably just be a pixel or two on this, on this video. But you can see that the cold dark matter of this lambda CDN model predicts that A, it's not just our Milky Way that will exist, but that there should also be lots of tinier things around it. Because each one of these little tiny yellow spots, these dark matter halos, could be locations where galaxies are forming in their own right but also that the history of our galaxy is rather a violent uh, and a very uh, you know, excitable process. It's been constantly bombarded by tiny galaxies, uh, and even bigger galaxies in some cases. And so in some ways, we, if we can use our observational data to actually predict whether or not our galaxy experienced these kinds of things in the past, that will help us gain more confidence in a model like this, which predicts that this should happen compared to any models where we don't predict that otherwise. Nowadays, you can actually go beyond embody simulations and actually start simulating the entire galaxy formation process, including the luminous matter. So this is a video uh, from the illustrious TNG collaboration, which is showing the formation of a disk galaxy, so kind of like our Milky Way. Um, and what's being shown here is the collapse of the dark matter on large scales, you then zoom into a little region here, which is now showing the collapse of ordinary gas, okay, in the middle. And the colors here represent the temperature of the gas. And now, in addition to gravity, the forces you need to care about are thermodynamics, you need to care about electrostatic uh, repulsion, you need to care about star formation, you need to care about the growth of black hole stars, so on and so forth. And eventually, over the course of time, you know, this is now looking at the point when the universe was maybe 8 billion years ago, and you can start seeing that you start forming a disk with spiral arms, kind of like the Milky Way does. If you look at its stellar material, you actually do see these spiral features in galaxies like Milky Way and Andromeda. And this is a calculation that was performed maybe 5, 6 years ago, okay? Um, and this is really a remarkable achievement, because even 10 years ago, producing disk galaxies like this was completely impossible. Not because our understanding of the physics was incomplete, that was, I mean it was incomplete, it still is incomplete, but mostly because we, were, we didn't have computers that were able to do highly re resolved enough calculations to be able to model this correctly. Okay? So progress in cosmological simulations is a simultaneous act between us developing our understanding, us developing better software, but also the hardware getting better so we can do better calculations. If you then actually look at a gallery of the kinds of galaxies that you predict in a cosmological hydrodynamical simulation like versus TNG, you get a very large diversity of things. And in fact, to the untrained eye, if you just showed them this, it's quite hard to tell whether this is a simulated universe or if it's the real universe. Okay? You see features like dust lanes and stars and spiral lines and bars and so on and so forth, so it's really quite remarkable. What happens if you now repeated that same exercise that they did in the 80s of comparing against galaxy redshift surveys, now taking more than just a few hundreds of galaxies that are measured in the CFA redshift survey, but taking the best data that we have at the moment with things like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, so that's shown in the upper panels over here, so this shows the distribution of galaxies that has been measured with telescopes compared with the prediction of the Lambda CDM model at the bottom. And I should say that these images have not been constructed so as to reproduce that. It is a prediction of the model. And it's remarkable that you find such a level of consistency, even for the fine-grained detail. And this is one of the reasons why 
slightly sleeker model, through the use of numerical simulations, has become the sort of standard reference model for cosmological So had there not been this development of cosmological simulations, we would not have been able to claim with such confidence that there is such a thing as star future, or there is such a thing as star energy. So unfortunately, this image hasn't rendered very well, but the, hopefully the main idea comes across uh, here. So this is just basically a historical compilation of the kinds of simulations people have been running over the course of time. This is basically the number of simulation particles being used on the y-axis and time in human years, I guess, on the x-axis. Um, and what you notice is that, you know, obviously as time goes by, um, you're able to do bigger and bigger things. Uh, and in fact, n-body simulations have roughly doubled in their size every 16 or 17 months or so, you know, if you just average it out. And this is actually fairly commensurate with this idea of something called Moore's Law, which you might have heard of, which talks about how uh, fast chips and computers actually get over the course of time, which basically doubles in their size every 18 months or so. Um, one thing you might recognize as being kind of very offset from the rest of the slide is that point up there, which I'll have it here, that is actually the Millennium Run in 2005. Um, and it's actually a bit of an outlier on this diagram. So this Millennium Simulation should have only actually been possible to do in 2010, based on you know, the trend before it. But it was actually done in 2004, so I think it was really complete um, And that's basically came up because there was a real step change in how uh, the, the uh, actual simulation code was operated. Um, okay, good. In, in recent times, even bigger calculations have been hey. Oh, there's a pointer? Uh, um, well, I think my, my, my comedy jump is like, that was probably the last time I did. Um, I felt a lot of rice move inside me. <laughs> Anyhow, um, in, in recent times, even bigger calculations have been possible. Um, so actually in, in 2016 and 2017, there were these things called the Outer Rim and the Euclid Flagship Project. The Euclid Flagship Project actually now has 8 trillion particles in it. This is going to be the flagship simulation of the Euclid Consortium. The Euclid uh, Space Telescope, of course, being the thing that launched like two days ago, right? Um, and so that is especially timely. And so 8 trillion, I think, certainly not something you can do on your phone, but uh, certainly not something I think Homer would have anticipated as being possible when he was, or rather his graduate students when they were the Okay, any questions at this point? Okay. Nothing too technically challenging here uh, up until now, I hope. So what I'll move on to now is the slightly more technical aspects of things, uh, which is telling you what is actually being done in these antibody simulations. Okay. Uh, now I should say that while I will talk you through a lot of the algorithms that people use for solving the equations of gravity in big settings, it is more than likely, unless you have any perverse reason for doing so, that you will not need to write an n-body code of your own. And certainly I think that would be beyond the ambitions of this week to get you to write a cosmology and n-body code. Of course, not so much if you use ChatGPT or something like that. You could actually get it to do work pretty well. Um, but rather, I want to give you a sense of what is happening under the hood of the stuff that you will be using, so that you kind of know um, what's actually happening, that it's not like a black box to you, um, but also how things can be changed. So the n-body method, basically the, the starting point of all of this is these sets of equations here. Um, this is actually nothing specific to dark matter uh, at all. This is something if you've, if you've ever done a, a class on fluids, uh, on, on um, just any kind of system that has positions and velocities and some flux of particles associated with it, uh, it is represented by this equation here which is called the collisionless Boltzmann equation. Okay? Uh, collisionless Boltzmann equation. Um, and what it does is that it basically relates the position, the velocity, um, and the sort of potential associated with a system, which we represent by f as a function of time in this differential equation here. And to basically close the system, 
you get another equation here, which basically tells you how this potential varies as a function of time and space. And that is basically in the gravitational setting, connected by Newton's gravitational constant, times by the integral of this, um, this, this thing, this f, which is called the phase space, which basically tells you the amount of stuff located at some position x with some velocity v at some time t. So of course, if we integrate over x and v, you'll get the total amount of stuff. So this thing here is called the distribution function and basically tells you the number density of particles at position x with the velocity v. All right. So this is called the collision with Boltzmann equation. This equation here is something called Poisson's equation. Okay? So Poisson's equation for gravity basically relates the gravitational potential with the density of matter. So if you solve these two equations, you are done. Okay? Because F here is basically every single dark matter particle located at some point x, v, and t at some time t. You just need to integrate this over all 10 to the power of you know, 300 dark matter particles in the universe, or more than that. Solve this equation as well, and then you have a full system. Okay? Uh, you could do that, but you'll also be a bit crazy. Uh, so instead, what you do is you try not to solve this fluid equation, but rather you try to approach it using a Monte Carlo technique. Okay, so with, with James, he talked about MCMC, sampling a space of parameters with a certain number of points. That is exactly what we're going to do in the hand body simulation, which is that we are sampling this distribution function with a set of macroscopic particles where now a particle is not, you know, a so many EV or so many GeV particle of dark matter, but it actually represents something like a million solar masses of dark matter, okay? So it, a particle in a simulation is not to be thought of as an individual particle of dark matter, but rather something that traces the phase space distribution of dark matter at some point x and at some velocity. So when you do all of that, then it's very simple for a particle i, the acceleration, so the two dots means two derivatives with respect to time, is given by the gradient of the gravitational potential. And the gravitational pot potential is just gm over i, okay? Um, gravitational constant, mass of the particles, and then you know, the, the distance of the other neighboring particles. And, no, and you've seen here that I've actually added this this term epsilon here. This is something we'll call the gravitational softening, which we'll talk about a bit later on. Uh, but it's just basically a, a, a number or a, or a function that is implemented here to prevent you know, a situation where x equals xj, so basically two things perfectly coincide with one another that will lead to your equations blowing up in your computer being very angry with you. Um, so that's what gravitational softening does. So, to get this to actually be an appropriate representation of things, uh, you need a very large n, n being the number of particles. Okay? So representing a, a dark matter, a universe of dark matter with just 10 particles is unlikely to be very useful. Um, so you need large n in order for this approximation to actually be valid. Um, why is that the case? Okay? Why is it that I cannot just take you know, if we think the universe has a mass of, say, 100, why can I not just take 10 particles of mass 10 each and say that this represents my whole universe and just do an body simulation like that? Um, the reason is because as we go from the left to the right, we are fundamentally breaking something. We are breaking this fluid approximation and treating things as particles that can influence one another. So that comes to this idea of something called relaxation time in an n-body system. So over the course of these next few days, I'll, I'll mention a few words that uh, it's basically a, a, a jargon that is used in the simulation community a lot. But the idea is that hopefully you will now know what that jargon refers to and, and, and how it applies to you. So relaxation basically applies to an n-body simulation or an n-body system where because you have gravitational encounters between a finite number of things of finite size, each thing imparts a momentum and energy onto the other thing. Okay? 
So if you have these encounters or collisions that is basically referred to as relaxation, and the rate at which this happens is something called the relaxation time of the system, which you can do the mathematics for it. It's, it's actually not a very difficult calculation to do. You will actually, if you ever do a, 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 a course on stellar dynamics or, or gravitational dynamics, you will, you will do this calculation. But essentially, you can work it all out and say that the relaxation time of the system basically varies as a function of the number of particles of the system divided by the size of the system. Uh, and this epsilon here is again the softening, or basically the closest distance two particles can get to one another, multiplied by the crossing time. The crossing time is basically just how long it takes for a particle to communicate from one end of the system to the other end of the system. So then it's basically by the size of the system divided by the characteristic velocity of the crossing. Okay? Um, characteristic size and velocity expression. So in a real dark matter halo, you have something like 10 to the 70 particles of dark matter. They're tiny things making up a very, very massive object. So, as soon as you plug in a number like 10 to the 70 into there, you will always reach a condition where the relaxation time is very long. Okay? So that means it is always in a collisionless limit because these binary impacts don't matter at all. However, in a simulation, the best simulations we do are of the order of 10 to the 9 particles, billions of particles. So the relaxation time becomes dramatically shorter. So in order for us to ensure that the simulation that we're doing is actually a collisionless system, which we think is what dark matter is, what, what stars and a galaxy do and so on, we have to basically ensure that the relaxation time is a lot longer than the typical age of the universe, which is referred to as the Hubble time. This is contrary to a system called a globular cluster. Have you come across the idea of a globular cluster before? So, so it's basically a very dense collection of stars. And the dense collection of stars basically means that even though you have a large M, you will have very close encounters in a relatively small system. So there the relaxation time often is shorter than the Hubble time. So when you do simulations of globular clusters, they are not collisionless systems. They are collisional systems. And you actually have to use different N-body techniques to solve them to the ones that we use for dark matter. Okay. So, N-body simulations or ground angle simulations that will break up into two. We have collisional systems and collisionless systems, depending on which limit you're in. Uh, for collisional systems, like these global cluster things, the most commonly used technique is something called the direct n-body, where you literally work out the gm over r squared interaction with the every set of particles, and that's why it's called a particle-particle interaction. And for collisionless systems, you can solve the gravitational problem in a variety of different ways, depending on whether they're used for short and immediate range forces or long range forces. And we'll talk about these uh, three in, in little detail soon. But essentially, modern-day cosmological simulation codes and body codes will make use of some combination of these types of techniques in order to decompose the overall gravitational force law over the entire universe into some combination of a long-range component and a short-range component. Okay? And exactly how this is done is, is a little bit of a philosophical question, um, but this is broadly the reason for the this. Okay, any questions at this point. All right. Good. So let's start with the very simplest one. So by the way, AMR here refers to something called adaptive mesh refinement. That is just another way by which you can solve Poisson's equation from very large scales to very small scales by making the grid that you solve Poisson's equations on very, very fine in regions where you need resolution and relatively more coarse over large distances. I won't be covering AMR codes in any detail here. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you uh, about them later on, but I'll mostly just focus on the Okay. So, the direct end body method we've kind of seen these equations already. Basically, you compute the acceleration of any particle as being the derivative of the potential. The potential is just given by summing the GM over R forces between any 
particle and its other counterparts. And they repeat that over every other particle in the simulation. You can quickly see that, well, firstly, this is very simple. Okay? If you were to write an n-body simulation code, if someone put a gun to your head and you had to write a code, this is kind of what you would do. I mean, that would be an old first thing for them to request. Uh, but this is what you would write. Um, but you can quickly see that this is not a useful way to do things because this is an n squared problem because you have to compute force in every individual set of particles. So if you double the number of particles, you quadruple the number of interactions you have to do. Um, so this has the benefits that it's uh, super easy to understand and it's very general, so it works in all situations. Uh, lots of something there. It's highly accurate. So in global cluster systems, again, where these pairwise forces have to be uh, integrated in supreme detail, this is the state of the art, actually. Uh, just augmented with, with GPUs nowadays, rather than just a CPU in this application. But it's computationally extremely expensive, so you would never want to do anything beyond a system having a, ten, uh, a million particles per day. Per the next simplest thing you can do is something called a particle mesh method. So this is pretty universally the technique that most modern day and body codes use in order to solve the Poisson equation of the gravitational forces on large cosmological scales. And the idea is really fairly simple. Okay? So imagine this is your simulation box, uh, which will say has the size of L box. It's filled with these particles here that are shown with these uh, green sign circles. Okay. Uh, what we'll then do is we want to get a representation of this discrete distribution of particles as some continuous field. Okay, because it's a distribution of mass in the universe. So what we'll do is we'll break up this box into a grid. Okay, of n cells in each dimension, so to, this is just a two-dimensional example, but there's n cells, n cells, and n cells, so it's an n cell cube volume. What you can then do is, with the help of a grid, you can turn a discrete mass distribution into a continuous mass distribution uh, by basically smoothing this using some approach. There are a variety of approaches you can use, called nearest grid point interpolation, cloud in cell interpolation, triangular shape cloud interpolation. And so if any of you have ever made images of particles or discrete points in, in IMSHO or NumPy histogram 2D, that is basically what is happening, right? Exactly this. And so what this does is that you now have a representation of the density field at coordinates x. Okay, this is the vector. Once you have that, you take a Fourier transform of this field. Uh, you'll find that Fourier tra transforms are very commonly used in astronomy because it makes solving Poisson's equation incredibly easy. It means you don't actually have to do a differential equation anymore. You can actually just do a multiplication in a second. It'll go down for about a second. So that basically transforms your density field as a function of position into a density field as a function of some wave number k. Have, have you come across the idea of Fourier transforms before? Okay. Some big idea. And then you solve Poisson's equation to get the potential. So Poisson's equation, remember, it was like nabla squared phi equals 4 pi g rho blah blah blah. So if you were solving that in position space, that means solving the nabla squared phi bit, which is a second order differential equation. When you take the Fourier transform, it just turns into a multiplication of two functions, which is this density field, which you've just got, times this thing called a Green's function. Um, okay, and the Green's function is it's a bit of an involved subject, but, uh, but in, in the simple Newtonian case, it's just one over distance square, or wave number square. So once you've done that, just multiply those two functions together, you get phi, inverse Fourier transform phi, and now you have your potential. That's function position. You have your potential. In each of these grid points, you can easily work out the derivative by just doing differences between points. And then you have your full gravitational force total to you. Okay? Really very simple. But you can see that a natural limitation to this is basically the size of an individual cell. 
Because what you're doing is you're taking all of this discrete particle distribution that is inside a cell and just making some big cloudy blow out of it. So you have suppressed a lot of your information into something simple and digestible. So the um, Fourier mode, this particle mesh method, while it's very simple and, and very accurate on these last distances, it's very fast as well, is increasingly inaccurate towards smaller scales. So if you care about forces between particles separated by distances that are comparable to or much smaller than the cell size, you just will not use this technique. So what do you do instead? Well, you could do particle mesh on large scales and particle-particle on small scales. So that's particle-particle-particle mesh. So those methods are called PQDEM methods, three Ps, I guess. Um, that can still be pretty expensive because depending on how good the mesh is, um, you might still have to do a lot of particle particle calculation. So instead, what people do is use something called tree algorithms. Okay? So a tree algorithm is actually not just limited to n body simulations by any means, it is generally a spatial decomposition technique. It is a technique that is used to be able to very quickly tell you what your nearest neighboring points are without computing the distance to every single point in the volume, okay? Because that is the expensive bit. Um, and so, even if you didn't care about gravity, any situation in life where you wanted to know who are your nearest neighbors or how many neighbors do you have within a given distance, you can use this tree method. So what does it do? Again, we start the distribution of particles. And let's say we care about the force on a particle here, which I'll label in pink, okay? Due to all the other blue particles in this box. What you can do is you can basically break down your simulation volume into cubic cells, and you group them in such a way that nearby cells are connected in such a way that there's only one particle in the cell, if there's more than one, you break the cell up into eight smaller cells, okay? When, it, when it's eight smaller cells, they're called octrees. Um, that's what they're called. Whereas further away particles, you don't care about breaking up into smaller cells. The reason being that if you're this person here, if you want to work out what is the amount of gravitational force coming from that corner of the box, you don't really care about these individual things here as long as these particles are really quite far away from this one here. So all you care about is just that there is a blob of mass in the distance. Okay? So a tree method, what it does is that it helps group these particles and only makes you care about the ones that are in the next to you. And essentially what happens is you have this particle of interest, you have a group of particles in the distance, you can compute what is the center of mass of these particles, and then see what is the angle subtended by this blobby region to you. Okay, this angle theta. If this angle is really small, that means the distribution of particles is really far away compared to the size of the region. Treat all of that as a single mass with the total mass of summing up all of those things together, located at some position given by the center of mass. If they're closer than some threshold value, he said, okay, I do kind of, I'm a little worried about what's happening inside. So I'm going to open up the cell and then start looking at the individual subcells inside it. Okay. And so you have a critical angle, it's theta critical. This is a parameter that would enter your n body code um, if, it's a, if it's a tree based code. Where if the angle between a point A and the rest of the distribution is less than that, you can say that it's far away enough and therefore the, set, the whole thing can be basically thought of as contributing just as a singular unit. If it's smaller than that, then you have to open up these subsets and originally and process them. So this dramatically reduces the amount of computation you have to do, because now, rather than work out all of these hundred different things, you can just work out one number. And then the gravitational potential just given by these points is basically just, again, GM, over R, when the over R is now being represented. 
So three methods are really uh, quite valuable. They are so these three plus particle mesh codes are some of the most common ones that are used. So in particular, um, there's a code called Gadget, which is one of the primary examples that makes use of these, um, uh, these particular methods. Um, so as I said, this is usually a value that we choose at runtime in a simulation. Uh, and so typical choices for this theta critical is somewhere between 0.6 and 1. Okay, so it's, it's normally suggested to you in a run file and you don't change it. Uh, and it's really easy. Okay, so we talked about tree methods, which basically told us if we have a particle here, what is the contribution of the forces from all of these onto this? Okay, so this is like a one sided. Thing. It basically tells you the contribution of all of this onto one point, which is this pink one. However, you can generalize this idea by saying that, okay, well, if I'm doing all that hard work anyway, why don't I also just group all of these particles together and work out the interaction between this whole node and that whole node? And then if I need to open these up and work out the initial force interactions, then I can just do that. So this would be like a two-sided uh, force calculation. So these two-sided force calculations are something called fast multiple methods. Okay. So the the code that we will use in our um, in our uh, interactive sessions, which is called Swift, that makes use of a fast multiple method. Okay. And what it does is the same idea as a tree, but rather than having a point and a group of particles, we have a group of particles and a group of particles, okay? So one is called a sink, because it's receiving all of the forces from this. The other one is called a source, because it's the one exerting the gravitational influence. And once you've worked out these interactions, then you don't need to work out separately for this, 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 what the contributions from these objects are, because they're all included in this cell. And for one step of calculations of these multiple moments, we have worked out what the influences on all the other particles. So it's dramatically faster. And importantly, the way the fast multiple method works is that if you sum up the potential from these particles and these particles, they always sum up to zero. So that means they directly obey Newton's third law of motion. Okay? So these codes, these fast multiple methods are manifestly momentum conserving codes, okay? which is a, a really powerful attribute for them to have. Uh, don't worry too much about the real specific details of it. Like I said, you, you won't really have to uh, worry too much about implementing, uh, I would advise you not to in fact, uh, to do that unless you really have to, but I just thought it's helpful to understand what's actually happening in these situations. Okay, and so basically you can, the, the Green's function expansion then just you know, it becomes a little more complicated. It's just, you just have to expand a larger number of terms. This is just a Taylor expansion, okay? A Taylor expansion of one over R, essentially. And whatever order you expand it to, of course, the higher number of orders you, you do, the more accurate the forces become. So this is, in the multi fast multiple uh, method code, this P, which is the order of the expansion, is a free parameter of the code. So you can ask it to do it up to a dipole, quadrupole, octopole, a hexadecapole, or a triacontadecapole. Basically, more and more accurate, but of course it means it takes longer and longer to do the first calculation. Okay. So, what that basically all boils down to is that if you want to compute the force on a particle, and you look at the distance from the particle, your 1 over r squared force, which you know, Newton told us when uh, it was, uh, is basically this dotted line like this. It is then broken down into a short range contribution and a long range con contribution, where the short range uh, could be due to uh, a tree and the long range could be due to a mesh. Okay? So, this is how we build the full force calculation in a cosmological box by using different methods. And you can see that this mesh method perfectly follows 1 over r squared on large distances, but on small distances, it fails. Because it's limited by the size of the cell. Okay, so the thing that's facing inaccurate, 
the tree is very good on short ranges, but you don't want to extend it to the length of clock, so you just truncate it at some point, and then you join these two up together. The this is all there is to an memory code. Okay. But if you do this well, it helps you avoid doing hundreds of millions of calculations that you would ever have to do. So think of the number of polar bears you say by not burning computers after that long. Okay, so we've worked out. Any questions so far on this stuff? Good. Um, so I'm going to come to the end of the technical details in a little bit, and then we move on to the first of the hands-on sessions. Before I do that, I'll just tell you about one more thing that you need to know, at least to begin with. Once you have worked out the forces, you then need to move the particles, okay? You have to integrate them in time. So how do you integrate particles in time? So once forces on particles have been calculated, we need to propagate these forwards, or, well, forwards or backwards in space, or but forwards in time. And by doing that, you basically have to update their positions and their velocities. Okay, so you initialize mass, position, velocity. This is basically your distribution function, f of x, p, t. You then have to update these values as a function of time. And you have to choose in, in what steps you do. And the easiest thing you can do is this thing here, called the Euler method, where you say that for a particle j, its position x, again, this is a bold x, meaning it's a vector, at some time step n plus 1, is just its position at some time step n, plus velocity times the size of the time step. Okay, this is just Newton's like kinematic equations, right? Speed equals distance over time in the real age. And similarly, the velocity at some later time is the velocity now plus the acceleration on this particle, which comes from computing the forces on the particles. Okay? Times the time. Easy, but wrong. Simplest case is called the Euler method. This is simple, but it's only first order accurate, which basically means that as time progresses, you know, if you build up small errors, they really grow in size, and then your system, which is supposed to be a stable system, just goes to berserk. I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, so it's acceleration, we said it's computed from four, uh, and that is the size of the time step. So you have to also worry about how big a, a jump in time you need to take, right? If you want to go, okay, let's just go from the start of the universe to the end of the universe in one step, that's a very long time step, and a very long time step. Uh, so you want to use shorter time steps to do this calculation. Okay? So instead, people use higher order time integration methods. Okay? Higher order just simply means you kind of do a little bit more work, but it's also a little bit more accurate. So higher order in this case means that instead of updating things all in one go in your simulation, you will update them piece by piece in three goes. And so how that looks is actually not so different from what we did before. We just do it in a slightly calmer manner. We say that now the velocity of a particle j, so we'll first update the velocity, okay? So not updating the position. The velocity on some particle j, after some time step n plus a half, half, so we don't move the full time step, we take the full time step and divide it by 2 instead is given by the velocity now, plus the acceleration times the size of the time step divided by 2. Okay? So this is something called a kick. You change the momentum. You then say, okay, now it's position at 7 plus 1 is given by the position now, plus the velocity at this point times delta t. Okay? So now, not half, but a full time step. This is something called a drift. So they are drifting in space. And then finally, let's complete the time step for velocity by just moving it that extra half a time step from n plus a half, n plus a half to n plus one. The same equation as before, just with half a time step and this updated acceleration, which you have already from doing those calculations. And this last step is called another kick. So, I don't know if you've ever heard of this phrase before, there's something called the kick drift kick method, um, for exactly this reason. You first update momentum, then position, then momentum again, 
just in slightly different sized time set. Okay. Um, so this is called a second order leapfrog method because you're basically jumping another frog, I guess, from one time to the next. They tend to be much more stable um, in terms of both how you handle errors, but also things like the uh, loss and the conservation of energy. And this is an example of what's called a slim, symplectic time integrator. Symplectic just simply means that you can time reverse this process exactly. So if you wanted to move the particle back to where it was at step n from n plus 1, you could just reverse these steps and you would exactly recover. So in physics, there's something, uh, you might have come across a concept of something called Noether's theorem, um, which basically says that in a, in a system, has it, has it, have people heard of Noether's theorem? So basically, if you have something called a Hamiltonian, which basically describes the overall dynamics of your system, if you conserve a quantity, if you, if you are symmetric in a quantity, you end up conserving it. Um, if you're symmetric in time, you end up conserving energy. So that's basically no theory in action. And conserving energy is kind of a good thing to be able to do. Not always guaranteed. Um, and so this is what I was talking about in terms of stability. So this left-hand side, oh, let's start with the right-hand side. So this is basically the method I was telling you about right at the beginning. This is this cake trick that they really think about. Um, so this is basically a problem. So this is called a Kepler problem. So it's just two particles in in an orbit, um, so you can solve that exactly um, because it's just a central central force. And so this yellow basically shows where that orbit started. And over time, you see that um, the orbit starts processing. Uh, the sort of uh, the ellipticity of the orbit completely changes, and this is happening only 50 orbits. Okay, it's a elliptic system. Only a ten, ten, every 10 orbit is, is drawn here, but you can already see how unstable the system is. That it completely uh, skews and, uh, and, and loses balance, and this is because of energy leakages. This is a leapfrog method of the same time step as that, um, and now showing over 200 orbits how much more stable it is. Okay, the fan is much less fanny, um, and, uh, and it's much more stable. In fact, if you used Adaptive time steps, meaning that you change the size of the time step depending on what the actual forces are, you would get far more accurate uh, values, uh, far more stable values. Than that. Um, and how one chooses the time step that will be the very last thing I tell you about. Um, but but this is basically the value of using the second order method. So every every n body simulation code that you will be using uh, basically uses some kind of second order deep flow method. The question that I haven't given you the answer to just yet is what is this delta t? Okay, so the size of the time step. How do you determine what should be point A and point A plus 1, or N and N plus 1? Okay, so the choice of the time step is actually where most codes tend to differ slightly at that level. So ideally, you would want your time step delta t to be as small as possible, okay? Because then you're just not losing information by just averaging the amount of time. Very quickly, you can re imagine this is going to be quite a disastrous choice because if you have very, very, very small time steps for very, very, very many particles in your simulation, billions and billions of particles, you will take very, very, very long to finish your calculation. Okay? Um, so instead, you realize that actually you don't need to do everything on small time steps because the universe doesn't care about. Because if you're a particle in the corner of the box here, what matters to you most is what is happening in your neighborhood. What are the close pairs of interactions that are happening? Okay? That is the dynamical system that is evolving fast. Whereas what is happening hundreds of megaparsecs or gigaparsecs away is evolving much more slowly because long range forces, they just take a while. So instead, simulations don't use fixed step sizes, i.e. the same value for all particles and at all time, but rather they adopt a hierarchy of time steps, and that is basically determined by asking which particles in the simulation do I need to evolve 
on a much quicker time scales, and which ones can I wait for a little bit before evolving the entire system as a whole? Okay, that is what the hierarchy is time scales are. A very common choice um, used in, for example, the gadget code, and uh, I think probably Swift also does something like this, is to basically say that the size of the time step taken by some particle j is given by the square root of the gravitational softening divided by the magnitude of the acceleration on that particle. So obviously if there's a very large force, i.e. this particle is feeling a very strong impulse, then you care about what's immediately happening in a very short space of time, rather than you know, being a particle in a void where maybe there's not much happening to you as well. And then usually there's a, there's a parameter that, that comes up in front of it, which is called the integration tolerance parameter. It's basically a free parameter that is um, used and, and determined at the start of your, your calculation, the parameter five beta calculations. Um, and yeah, there, are, there are a variety of choices for this. Obviously, the smaller this value is, the more accurately you're integrating uh, stuff. Um, and sometimes it boils down to essentially experimenting with a bunch of different choices for things and then deciding what it is that you care about being reproduced accurately every single time in something called a convergence test, which is something that we'll talk about on Thursday. Uh, and then basically your, your problem is, is, is fully defined. You have a system of equations, you have a, well, you have a starting point, you have a system of equations, which is your gravitational force law, which you can choose to solve in one of many different ways, in the ways that I talked about. You have different ways of integrating stuff, just evolve the system forward and see what the universe tells you. That's an end of simulation. I've told you nothing about cosmology at this point. Where does cosmology come in? Where does dark energy come in? Where does dark matter come in? And so on. That will be the subject of what we will talk about in day two or so on Wednesday. Um, just one more thing. I mentioned AMR codes previously. So codes where you have cells that are being made finer and finer and finer in regions where there's a lot of, say, dark matter, a lot of particles, and they're coarser and coarser, where there's fewer stuff. In those cases, the time step is defined. There's no softening in an AMR code in that respect, okay? Because the softening is naturally kind of set by the size of these cells, in some ways. Because that is defining the resolution of the simulation. The time step then is sometimes set by something called the uh, CFL condition. It stands for the um, but all that basically says that is that a particle cannot move a distance that is bigger than the size of the cell at faster than the speed of light. So your time step basically is limited by the condition that a particle cannot move from point A to A plus cell size in faster than the speed of light. Seems fairly reasonable, and that's basically what the MR terms do for this in the abstract of stuff. Okay, good. I said an hour 15 minutes, and uh, an hour 12 minutes. So damn good. <laughs> All right. So now I will hand over the floor to my much worthier and better second half, uh, Sean, uh, who will run us through the hands-on session uh, of, the, the, of the very first kind. Since we have only 15 minutes before the coffee break, what we will use this uh, moment to do is Sean will kind of give you a little overview of what it is we're going to be doing and some logistical elements of stuff. In case you didn't capture those details at the start, all these lectures, slides that I showed you, they're all here. The notebooks, which uh, hopefully have, have been cloning or will be cloning, um, can be found there. Uh, Sean, it's all yours. Yeah, so um, like Sam said, I think for this 15 minutes, we very quickly will do what we'll do in the next session, uh, but mainly just trying to sell the logistics of it. So for those who aren't already, Go to this GitHub link uh, and basically click it and download it to your laptop. So, hopefully, most of you can like, right? Has anyone done it yet? So, for me, it can be a little bit because the download is very quick. Which one is? Can you finish that with it? Okay, I'll switch it back. Okay. Well, the first one, yeah, they go to the, the GitHub and download it. So, I'll just go over my name. Oh, yes. Oh, fuck. Okay. 
should have all the instructions at the beginning of session 18. Uh, and everything should kind of work. Uh, a, few, a, few, a few places there's certain steps you need to do. So I often joke that Duke Neville won't run out of the box. There's very minor steps you need to do in between. So have a quick read and sort of one, run it one at a time rather than the whole thing all at once. Uh, and that's it really for each session. And the one extra thing that's important for these sessions is actually running the simulations themselves. So the actual simulation code we're going to be using is Swift. So if you're on the README, uh, this should have all the information you need about this detail. Uh, so if you go down to the README, a uh, little intro, installation requirements. So we, we're going to need Python 3.8 or higher. This is one of the requirements for the Python package that Swift uses. So it's quite key to actually do that, and then within this requirements file, that's it. D is all the modules, Python modules you need. Uh, so we're trying to install those. I know there's a few issues, like one of them called CAM, there's a bit of an issue on some of the Mac machines. So if you raise any issues, just call us, basically, we'll, we'll give you a hand. Uh, and then the Swift simulations. So ideally, we want to be, this want to be like on a shared machine where everyone can just log in, it's pre compiled, and you can run it. We can get up and running, so what we're going to have to do is you're going to have to install Swift on your own laptop. But we're going to basically put this as an option for you to do if you want to. Because it can be a little bit of a pain to get these codes compiled. So for those who really want to run the simulations, please go to Swift, download it from the GitHub, and try and install it. You're going to need these requirements as in the FFTW libraries, HG5 libraries, GSL. Again, give you a hand if you want to handle this. But for those who don't really care too much about running the simulations and don't want to have to bother, which I think is reasonable, uh, there's pre-run simulations in the uh, GitHub directory for you. So if you go in this simulations folder, uh, this is the pre-run simulations for each session. So it's split into this. The minute there's only one and two, so we'll talk about session three maybe tomorrow or Wednesday. Uh, if you go to session one, there's a few directories here, and this basically has all the simulation outputs you need. And then the only thing you then need to change in your Jupyter notebook is there'll be somewhere, which I think I've also highlighted by writing it in the, in the markdown text, there'll be a place where you write where your simulation is, where you want to actually read the files from. You just need to redirect that to this folder, and it should work. Um, any immediate questions? Again, if you have any issues installing this stuff, just be on the phone you have, essentially. Uh, if not, then for now, just quickly try. Sean, do you want to uh, tell them what the different simulations are? What the different sessions are about? Yeah, sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. I was too occupied with the technical detail. So anyway, maybe we'll just uh, leave it at uh, session one today, and we'll talk about session two when we, we get to it. Uh, so the idea with the first session is basically run a simple simulation. We're going to ignore cosmology, and we're just going to run some isolated DOM halos. And the idea is that, again, a pre ramp if you don't want to run them, but in general, set up you run these yourselves. Uh, so it sort of goes through the steps you need to set up the simulation. So we start with giving you the initial conditions that you need. So these are already generated for you. There's a script that generates them if you're interested in looking at how that works. Uh, so we have a quick look at what the initial conditions look like. You then run the simulation. Again, you can skip this if you want to and just look at the pre run simulations. Uh, and then we go and analyze some of the results. And the particular simulations we've set up uh, is where we're going to have these merging systems. So you're going to have this bigger halo sat in the middle of your box, and then you have this small halo that's been set up to basically throw it at the uh, big halo. So in this case, um, that's not. Oh, sorry. So um, hopefully it should. Uh, Hopefully it should run okay for you. I think I've accidentally uploaded an older version of the GitHub that hasn't iterated through the snapshots, but um, I'll update that in a second. But anyway, you should see these payloads fly together and interact and fly apart. Uh, yeah, I think we can yeah, start. Um, and yeah, I think just the other thing I said, in terms of the preset cells, you know, if you, if you just ran those, I think you'd be done with the session. Um, but really, I think the idea is for you to kind of understand the, the code that is in there, to see how Sean is reading the stuff in, and, and then visualizing and then doing stuff with it. And then there's a bunch of extra exercises at the bottom of each of these workflows.
um, which are basically where you can try and uh, go beyond really and think about maybe running a different version of the same simulation by changing some things around, uh, recompute stuff, do fancy and fancy things, and, and, and really that's kind of the style here that how much you, you gain out of the bare bones of these things is, is really up to how much you want to gain out of them. So, so take, you know, feel, feel free to explore as you wish and have no galaxy to be closed in the course of this. Uh, well, some might be actually going to do it, but, uh, but that's kind of encouraged. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so like I was saying, so there are these extensions, but I really encourage, as you go through the workbook, if you have an idea that you're like, oh, what happens if I plot it this way, or what happens if you cook in days like this, or whatever is interesting to you, just mess around in that given like bit of the code and, and, and go through it. So you don't have to wait to the end of the set the, the notebook to actually start messing around with whatever you want to do. Uh, it's set up in a way that hopefully there's sort of this minimum level you get through and you walk you through it, but go off the rails and explore with the simulations and see what happens. And you ask that. I guess five minutes. Yeah, if everyone can kind of just get, make sure you get downloaded, maybe install the, the Python modules you need, and then if any issues, just yeah. give us a check. If you're interested, you can also start trying to compile Swift as well. Yes. So if the thing is working. And, and being able to run your own simulations is also useful to have. So if you can get it to work, that would be